Welcome back to the build of my Rayon's S20 Raven. In my last video, I went over covering the fuselage with fabric. It was a long process, but worth the challenge. In this video, I'm going to continue along and cover mounting of the firewall components. As you can see, I have the panel mounted. Let me show you how I got here. The first thing I needed to do was to remove the whole fuselage from the rotisserie. The setup served me well, but the fuselage was getting just a little too heavy for it as the small wheels bind up when I try to move it, and I was always tripping over it. So I built this carriage cradle of sorts that accomplishes a few things. It's sturdy and agile enough to allow easy moving the entire airplane within a confined space, which comes in handy when they need to get both cars and the airplane into the garage when the Texas hailstorms arrive. This will also eventually make it easy to move to a hangar and paint shop, as I made sure the caster wheels are mounted narrow enough to fit on a U-Haul ramp. I used 2x6 boards throughout. The base featured four swiveling wheels, two of which are lockable. I wanted the entire thing to be able to pivot, so I built up a sturdy hinge arrangement with big bolts. Then the base is secured to the fuse lines through the landing gear leg mounts. To make it easier to move when loading onto a truck, I added handles and an eyelet for a winch. For the tail, I just use the kit tail wheel assembly. Like everything when building an airplane, it's kind of a jigsaw puzzle, as this needs to happen before this and that. So next was to install the rudder pedals before the boot cowls went in place, before mounting the components on the other side of the firewall. I had previously built up the rudder pedal assembly while I still lived in Salt Lake. To provide a good non-skid surface on the pedals, I wanted to use marine anti-slip tape but the plans called for round head rivets, which would not allow the tape to lay flat. So I replaced them with countersunk rivets and painted everything black. The rudder system is actually quite intricate and I almost missed the tension springs mounted through the firewall. Mounting the pedal assembly was pretty straightforward after riveting the floor panel in place. I connected all the hoses, torquing the fittings and making sure there was plenty of clearance during full travel. I later added some spiral wrap to some of the hoses so they don't rub directly against the firewall. Next was figuring out what and where to mount all the components to the firewall. The process was somewhat straightforward because as I mentioned previously, I'm going to use the Rotax 912 IS engine. With all the carburetor issues people seem to complain about with the 912 ULS, I thought it wise to go with the FETA controlled engine, which eliminates the carburetors using fuel injection and electronic ignition. The computer also has an eco mode that provides 30% better fuel economy over the 912 ULS. Looking forward to that one. And since Rams does not offer a firewall forward kit specifically for the 912 IS, I'm walking the line between their 912 ULS kit for the S20 and 915 kit for the S21. Here I have the coolant overflow bottle mounted along with the fuel filter and oil tank. Then in the center of the firewall is the battery tray just above the engine computer. I also mounted the fuse block high on the firewall so I could access it in the field from the oil filler door in the cowling. That way I wouldn't need to remove the entire cowling just to replace a fuse. I'm using an electric valve for the heater water line in the engine compartment. The plans call for a mechanical valve in the cockpit and although this arrangement may be a little lighter, it adds hose connections in the cockpit, which being prone to failure would spray hot water all over me. So I'm going all electric and mounting all the valves in the engine compartment, leaving only two simple hoses in the cockpit. There were so many wires, I had to add a second harness feed through. And since these are potted to prevent smoke getting into the cockpit, I added a few spare wires for future upgrades. Then as I kept adding parts to the firewall, it was starting to get a little crowded. Here I've added the master and starter relays with the battery hall effect current sensor mounted to the battery tray. Both a computer and starter relay needed to be mounted isolated from electrically contacting the firewall metal, so they used rubber collets to isolate the bolts. I noticed that the stock mounting bracket for the oil tank had rather sharp edges where it would contact the tank sides, which could eventually cause a hole. So I made sure to bevel and smooth all the edges of the bracket before cinching down the tank. I kept a constant vigilance for any holes in the firewall as to prevent any smoke or fumes getting into the cockpit. Even a little smoke or exhaust making it through a tiny hole can cause all kinds of problems, 
so any bolt or rivet going through was coated with a high temp sealant. And as added insurance, I've added an electronic carbon monoxide detector behind the instrument panel. Speaking of preventing smoke breaching the firewall, when I first installed the feed throughs for the fuel lines, I used aluminum fittings. Then a few weeks later, I realized that, duh, aluminum would burn through pretty quickly, even in a modestly hot fire. So I replaced them with stainless steel and made sure all the rest of the oil or fuel fittings forward to the firewall were stainless steel as well. Next was to install the instrument panel, which I had powder coated before leaving Salt Lake. When building up a wire harness, it's always a good technique to encase completed connectors in plastic bags as it keeps dust or construction debris off the connector pins, preventing any intermittent problems down the road. The instrument panel went in easily as my extensive prep work and careful measurements paid off. When installing the switches and breakers, I covered the socket with tape so as to not mar the panel surface. And just as an aesthetic thing, the mounting nuts are all tightened so the hex points all line up vertically. This is a long time tradition with professional looking instrument panels, just as you would with screw slots on the switch panels in your home. While I still had easy access to the wiring harness, it was a good time to wring out all the wires, or at least everything except the engine harness. I referred back to the installation manuals for the connections, checking them against my drawings as a double check to ensure I hadn't made any mistakes. And I was fortunate that I did as I discovered I had made an error when transposing the Rotax power connections to my drawings. That's why we check. I rung out the wire connections all the way back to the circuit breakers and single point grounding block. Here I'm checking the G3X display wires and also the servo wires. Oh, and I always set the meter to measure resistance so I can see if there is any excessive resistance in the wires or connectors. Using just the beeping function of a continuity checker doesn't reveal if the resistance is excessive. The actual maximum resistance, or voltage drop, depends on the length of the run, as found in the charts in the AC4313. Granted, the runs are very short in my airplane, so the resistance should be less than 1 ohm, with most of that being the meter leads. During this important testing process, I also discovered a shorted music jack. Even though I'll probably Bluetooth music directly to my headsets, I installed a stereo music jack wired to the intercom. Maybe just out of habit, but it may be useful someday. Replacing the jack was easy at this point before it was mounted permanently into the center console. Once I get the engine harness complete, I'll conduct a full power and ground check of every component connector, just to be sure the power is correctly polarized before plugging in any components. Performing these checks is an important part of any electrical or avionics installation, as it's easy to fix the little things now ensuring full capability and possibly avoiding very costly troubleshooting repairs later. I had formed the boot cowls and floor a while ago while I was still in Salt Lake and it was time to install them as I didn't need full access to all the wire harnesses or fluid lines anymore. First though was to apply paint to the inside of each panel. The bottom panels will be a prime spot to collect water so it was important to layer on zinc chromate to prevent corrosion. Although, it was important to remove the zinc chromate around the transponder antenna mounting holes, as a UHF antenna needs a good bond to the structure for a ground plane. I also dropped in some panels between the cockpit floor and bottom cowl for soundproofing and thermal insulation. Since the boot cowls will cover the edges of the fabric, and the carriage will use the gear mounting holes, I applied a few coats of Ecofill before permanently mounting the panels. Everything riveted into place nicely, although I didn't rivet any of the cowls to the firewall yet. I'll save that for when I fit up the engine cowling. And now for the tip of the day. We had an incident here concerning the Toyota dealer and an oil plug. My wife took her car to the dealer to have an oil change, along with a few other service items. That night, I noticed a puddle under her car, and yes, it was oil. I wasn't too alarmed at first because I know sometimes a little oil drips when changing a filter. But then the next night, there was another small puddle of oil, I shimmied under the car and found the oil drain plug nearly about to fall off, with only a couple threads still holding it in. So after tightening it up, I let the service manager at the dealer know, and boy was he apologetic, realizing I just saved him from buying us a new engine. This reminds me of another incident many many years ago, where an instrument technician removed a fuel line fitting to access the instrument panel. Well, upon reinstallation, he didn't torque the fitting, just leaving it finger tight. Luckily, the pilot realized the stream of fuel was gushing out of the cowling as he was about to start the engine. Oh boy.
So the lesson here is to never leave a bolt, nut, or fitting just finger tight, thinking you'll come back later to torque it. Finish the task before moving on, because you'll most likely forget it. If you must leave something just finger tight, at least label it somehow, as I did here previously with the brake reservoir line. In my next video, I'm going to go over mounting the engine and managing all those hoses and wires.